Hello and welcome to Famine in Land. My name is Rick Becker and today's topic, the grip of the cult-like New Apostolic Reformation or the NAR. Well, if you've never heard about the NAR, then think no further than Bethel Church in Redding, California. That will give you a good indication of what a, a church under the spell of this movement looks like, what they teach and, and practice, etc. It's really not a new movement and there's nothing new about it. It's basically repackaged heresy stemming back to the latter rain movement. Um, perhaps you've heard of a man by the name of William Branham. He was influential. And uh, unfortunately, despite the fact that he uh, dabbled in, in the occult and was really a false teacher, he's revered and admired by men like uh, Bill Johnson and, and Chris Vallotton of Bethel Church, who, who actually asked God for his mantle and his anointing. But uh, to give you some an idea of some of the other identifying uh, markers of, of this movement, there's an emphasis, a really big emphasis on signs and wonders, the belief that we can perform greater miracles than Jesus. Um, they also have what they call the seven mountain mandate or the seven spheres of society, where they believe that believers are to uh, take dominion or at the very least influence uh, the seven pillars of society, arts, culture, education, religion, etc., to the extent that when Jesus returns, he's coming back to a sanitized or a Christian planet. Um, then as well, um, you'll find that there's a lot of bizarre behavior that accompanies this movement, such as uh, kundalini-like manifestations. Perhaps you've seen uh, people contort and twist in the meetings when the apostle lays hands on them. They look like they're demon-possessed, actually. Um, ecstatic laughter. Um, you've probably heard that they find feathers in the auditoriums. Uh, you've possibly heard of Bethel's glory cloud. They believe that uh, God manifested in the form of a, a glory cloud. But one of the easiest ways to identify it would be also just to look out for the buzzwords. So in these circles, you'll hear words like uh, shift, you know, changing the atmosphere, alignment, open heaven, open portals. Um, that they, they believe their words are, are causative because the NAR borrows a lot of false theology from other movements like Word of Faith. So you'll often hear the apostles and prophets make decrees and declarations. And then uh, there's a lot of uh, mysticism that goes on in this church. People are, are taught to have soaking sessions and then they take guided trips to heaven. And so you'll, you'll, uh, that's one of the ways to identify the movement in a nutshell. Um, although the title of this, this episode is the cult-like grip of the new apostolic reformation, um, I must point out that what I'll be speaking about today doesn't just apply to the New Apostolic Reformation. It applies to any sort of uh, manipulating, controlling, or spiritually abusive church, uh, to churches involved in the Word of Faith movement, the health and wealth or prosperity gospel, um, obviously hyper-charismatic hyper churches, possibly some charismatic churches, and then movements like IHOP, International House of Prayer in Kansas City. I'm sure you've, uh, you you know about the current scandal. And this all could have been avoided, all could have been avoided if we just applied the biblical test, which is to test a man's life and his doctrine. Um, now, one of the things that you've probably experienced, and if you've come out of the NAR or some sort of abusive church, one of the first things you want to do when, you, when the Lord has graciously opened your eyes to the deception you were caught up in is to obviously go and warn your family and friends who are caught up in a similar form of deception and possibly left behind in the church that you left. And you've probably noticed that trying to reason with them and trying to warn them, it's almost like banging your head against a brick wall. In fact, it's like engaging somebody in the cults, like speaking to a Mormon or Jehovah Witness and try to convince them of the truth. And that's because this movement is cult-like, and uh, unfortunately its followers have been brainwashed to a large extent. But since I've called it all, or, yeah, since I've described the NAR as being cult-like, we're going to take a brief look at the characteristics of cults and see if there are any similarities between the characteristic of a cult and what's prevalent in the NAR and other churches, as I explained. So one of the first ways to, uh, to examine a cult, to see if they're a cult or not, is to take a really good look at the leader, at the founder of the cult. And in most instances, you'll find that the founder or the person who started the cult or false religion claims to have had some sort of divine encounter. 
they will claim to have an experience or a visitation uh, from God or Jesus or an angel. And during this encounter or this experience that they've had, they will claim to have received some sort of divine mandate from God, some sort of commissioning. Uh, God or the angel or Jesus gave them some new revelation. And what this does is it now it elevates them above their followers. They're special. They've been chosen by God. So, you know, you can't question them. You, you can't test the experience. So they are now in a prime position or they're on a really good platform to manipulate and control their followers. And so because of their elevated status, they, they almost act as a mediator between God and their followers. And their followers look up to them and, and look to them to receive spiritual guidance, to receive knowledge, and to experience the blessings that these uh, leaders are able to give to their followers. And then a second characteristic is to take a look at, at their attitude or their belief concerning the scriptures. Uh, do they consider the word of God as infallible, as inspired, as sufficient? Well, obviously they don't. And they either twist, ignore, alter the scriptures, or come up with their own scriptures. Um, for example, the, the Jehovah Witnesses have their New World Translation, and the Mormons have the Book of Mormon. So let's pause there for a minute. Um, perhaps your mind's already made the connection. But what I've described really applies as well to the contemporary self-appointed apostles and prophets in the New Apostolic Reformation. Let me explain. If you think of some of, if you know some prominent modern-day apostle or prophet, and you listen to their, their messages and you read their books, you'll find that all of them, most of them, usually point to some sort of encounter that they had with God. You see, their authority is based on their claims and this experience that they had. And in some cases, they would <clears throat> claim that uh, you know God physically shook their bodies. Perhaps they felt electricity surging through their bodies. Perhaps they were in some sort of uncontrollable state. And this, in some instances, can go on for days or weeks or months. Um, and then some of them will claim that Jesus appeared to them. Uh, Chris Velaton, for example, Bethel's false prophet, he claims that Jesus Christ walked through the wall of his bathroom, and while Chris was in the bath, Jesus said to him, you're a, you're a great leader, and you're a prophet, and blah, blah, blah. And then um, in the, second, in the sec uh, second sort of part of this is that usually they would claim to have received some sort of mission, mandate, mantle, anointing, or calling from God. Um, perhaps you've heard they sometimes refer to the words the word download, they received a download from God. So it's exactly the same as cult leaders. And the effect is exactly the same. They are now elevated. They're in an elevated status. They sort of act as a mediator between God and the followers, or, or they become a conduit for God's blessings. And the followers chase after them and, and look up to them and, and, and uh, hope to get an impartation or transference of anointing from these people. And at the same time, um, they also sort of fear these people in the same, just like in the cults. Cult followers know that if they, they step out of line, if they don't conform to group culture, etc., they're going to be in trouble. And it's the same in the NAR. They are taught that uh, if they disobey, if they ask valid questions, or if they don't conform, then they'll be in trouble. They'll incur the wrath of not only the, the pastor or the leader, but the followers and possibly even God himself. I mean, these people are, can be very manipulated. If you step out of line, you'll, uh, you'll find that they accuse you of um, having a Jezebel spirit or a religious spirit, possibly that you're even opening yourself up to some form of demonic attack unless you submit to their rules. And so what this experience does is, is that these apostles and prophets are able to bypass the biblical qualifications to teach and preach which is their life and their doctrine. The authority is based solely on their experience, their revelations, and now they're in that uh, position to, to abuse people under them. And you dare not touch the Lord's anointed. I'm sure you've heard that as well. Now, while they might sort of, they'll claim to, uh, you know, be accountable and be in partnership with other ministries and, and, and that they're not just some sort of king sitting on top ruling their kingdom. But in fact, they are all they're doing is with their partnerships with other self-appointed 
apostles and prophets combined, that's just a wolf pack. That's not men of God submitting to one another. Um, and then, of course, like the cults, they ignore, twist, or alter the scriptures. In fact, the NAR, you could say, has its own Bible, and that is called the Passion Translation, written, concocted, should I say, by a man by the name of Brian Simmons. He's the guy who came to went, who went uh, take a trip to heaven, and God showed him a library in heaven with, with an extra chapter in the book of John that was not allowed to be released yet. But um, this is quite interesting, and just like the apostles and prophets, uh, Brian Simmons bases his whole authority on an experience. In 2009, on the Sid Roth show, he said that uh, he had an experience with Jesus and the presence of the Lord was tangible. Oh, sorry, that's another buzzword. Presence of the Lord is tangible. And uh, Jesus commissioned him and Jesus told him that you're going to do this translation, that he's going to do this translation project. And then he says, Jesus breathed on me. He blew his breath on me and I'll never forget that experience. He promised me that he would give me help, that he would stand with me and give me secrets of the Hebrew language and secrets of the Bible. And this would be for the last day's awakening. Um, uh, Simmons also claimed one at one time he was in a church and he saw an angel and God told him the name of the angel is Passion and that's how he came up with the Passion translation. So apart from twisting the scriptures like this and basically rewriting the own Bible, the NAR have a really, really low view of Scripture. They downplay Scripture totally. And I just want to give you two brief quotes as an example. Uh, this is what Chris Bellaton writes in one of his blogs. It's a paramount that in this new season, we clearly understand the apostles' mantle and mandate to transform culture. Let me just stop there. That's a seven-mountain mandate. With this Fresh revelation, Balaton says, we lay governmental foundations. Apostles create covenantal family relationships relationships because believers are attached to and through fathers, mothers, and family, not doctrine. This promotes freedom for people to think creatively, to dream, to envision with God, and to experience new depths of the Holy Spirit. This relational security creates an environment that attracts revelation. Say what? New age, law of attraction there. Basically what he's saying is if you're not connected and if you don't trust and if you don't submit to an apostle, you're basically not really have a, going to have a relationship with God. You're not going to attract revelation. Um, you see that how they downplay scripture? All the revelation we need is already in scripture. We have to read it in context, study it, and obey it. We don't need to attract revelation because we submitted to an apostle. And by the way, uh, I forgot to mention this in the beginning, one of the, the marks of an NAR church is, is that they they teach the restoration of the fivefold ministry, specifically the restoration of the apostle and prophet. So they believe that prophets and apostles together govern the church. Without their direction and vision, the church cannot function properly, cannot mature. And then another brief quote from another Bethelite, Danny Silk. Most teachers today are fixated on the word of God, on the written word of God. Shouldn't we be? He continues, they believe that the word of God is the source of life and truth on the earth. Their value for the word is much higher than their need for the supernatural. These are the lawyers, scribes, and Pharisees of our day. Can you believe it? Well, the word of God is the only source of truth and life on earth, isn't it? And uh, when he says the word of the need for the word, the value for the word is much higher than their need for the supernatural. This is what they always do. They create this false dichotomy and they put the Holy Spirit against the Word of God. They don't realize that the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God and that uh, works within the boundaries that God has created. But there you have the, um, a similarity, a frightening similarity between the cults and the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, <clears throat> there's some other characteristics of cults, and maybe I'll just go through them briefly, that are prevalent in the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, firstly, there's always a blind allegiance to the vision. So in the cults, uh, you know, you'll find that they have these sort of pet doctrines or teaching and it's it's focused on the end times or whatever the case may be. It's it's really the same in the NAR. There's blind allegiance to the vision. And each sort of uh, NAR apostle or prophet at church will have their own sort of flavor. So, for example, in Bethel, it's all about um, revival. It's all about transforming culture. It's all about signs and wonders and experiences with God. 
in the International House of Prayer. It's all about, uh, I think, what was Mark Bickle's theology, the bridal theology. It revolved around that. And so the followers have to buy in the vision, into the vision of the, teach, of the teachers. and the, They cast the vision, and you're either in or out. Um, another very obvious one, false signs and wonders. Just like the false signs and wonders and bizarre manifestations in pagan religions, you'll find the same thing in the NAR. Um, and then, uh, you know, talk about false signs and wonders. The church is such a low bar in the in the visible church today that when these guys come along like Todd White and they pretend to do a miracle and lengthen the one leg, I mean that's just a snake oil salesman trick. He's just he's just pulling and, and twisting and contorting the leg to make make as a you know God's actually doing something. That's how the low the bar is. That that people, if 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 you fooled by such obvious trickery, what are you going to do? If there's an antichrist with with really convincing false signs and wonders, it's really sad that people fall for such stupidity. Anyway, that's uh, you know, once again a sign and a wonder. Then obviously there's a lot of experientialism and mysticism, exactly the same as the other cults and false religions. Um, the power of suggestion is utilized. That plays a, a huge role in in what we see in the, in the church today. Um, I'm sure you've you've been in a service or you've seen a. a a sermon or a message on TV, and and the worship, uh, the worship leader, all of a sudden declares, "Wow, the presence of God is in this place. The tangible presence of God, the Spirit is moving." And and they are hyping up the crowd. The crowd, they are preparing the the people. They are they are creating a sense of expectation and 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 uh, suggesting that God's presence, that God is at work there. Because if they can get you to believe that God is working there then you're going to accept the teachings that follow and all the other nonsense. And if you don't feel it, then that just means, well, you're not special enough or you've got sin in your life or whatever. Um, continuing, there's obviously a lack of transparency. Critical thinking is prohibited. Uh, and then one of the, the biggest reasons the Bible says people are false teachers is that they teach for shameful gain. And so there will be a real... Uh, Cults and false religions need money to print their literature, their materials, and purchase buildings. And the NAR need the money for their buildings and their flashy, comfortable lifestyles and their big ranches. And one of the ways they do this is to make sure they can save money on staff salaries by getting as many uh, voluntary employees or actually slaves to do things for free. And then they'll they'll hammer you with a with a with a doctrine of tithing, and they will preach from Malachi. And, uh, you know, they really don't understand the difference between the Old and the New Covenant, the Law and Gospel, prescriptive or descriptive texts. So they twist and manipulate the people to give their tenth, which we really don't have to because we're not under the law and we give voluntary, cheerfully, sacrificially. That's how we give. Um, <clears throat> but they make it into a formula. So if you give your tenth, God will bless you, etc. Then uh, I think I've touched on this, uh, untouchable leaders. They really... They're really, uh, uh, in, in Mormonism, you get the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, the first Quorum of the Seventy, and in the NAR, you get the self-appointed apostles and prophets. Don't dare question them, because uh, they've had an experience with God that you haven't had, and God is using them, and God is not using you. Uh, so that's a form of uh, spiritual elitism, also another mark. And they really believe that uh, they are on the cutting edge of God is what God is doing in NAR. They believe that God is giving them visions, downloads, and using them in a mighty way to transform the earth. Um, then another one, obviously, there's real unhealthy dependency. Um, leaders are conduits for truth, guidance, spiritual blessings, and their followers look to them for all kinds of blessings. Um, and, and the unhealthy dependency stems from the ability to manipulate and control their followers. I don't know if uh, you remember the heavy shepherding movement in the 70s, I believe, or 80s. Really an intense discipleship movement where um, you basically couldn't do anything unless your leader had peace about it. So you couldn't move to another town, you couldn't get a job, you couldn't date somebody unless your leader had peace. That's a heavy sort of covering uh, theology, which is still around. And uh, if you've heard of a man by the name of John Bevere and his book Undercovering, oh, that's like... Uh, a master class in how to manipulate the people under you. Really, really dangerous teachings there from uh, John Bevere and, and this heavy covering teaching. 
and obviously it is man like any cult man centered work based uh you know because man is elevated you have a a weak god who's really dependent on you to get the job done so there's a lot of emphasis on what we need to do to help god and to partner with god to get the jo job done uh, i think bill johnson's uh, what's that quote from bill johnson god's in control but is not in charge or yeah something like that to effect but really it has elevated man almost to a level of little god and then obviously new revelations new teachings new doctrines just like any cult or false religion and then the really sad but the really sad but where the nar and these churches are similar to cults is if you start questioning or you leave the church because you are going to go through a really sometimes really ugly and nasty experience and process you'll be accused of as i said having a religious spirit uh, operating out of, operating out of offense um they'll start maybe slandering you judge you even from the pulpit or give you threats in the form of prophetic words and you'll be shamed and isolated and shunned and that's where so much damage is done that exit process from the nar but moving along have you ever wondered what the attraction is what lures people into these churches into the nar churches and um other movements in general what what attracts them um, you know, because we we tend to sort of put the blame on the false teachers, don't we? That guy deceived me, or this guy's a wolf, this guy's a heretic, and that's why I was caught up in these movements and false teachings. But um, Timothy gives us a slightly different perspective. And the problem is not so much with the mouth that's distorting the scriptures. It's with the ears, the itching ears, who, who are getting exactly what they want. 2 Timothy, 3, uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 to 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So you see, that's exactly where the problem is. And uh, itching ears have been around for a long time. Uh, I just want to read quickly from Jeremiah 5, 30 to 31. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule at their own direction. My people love to have it so. Boy, isn't that what we're seeing uh, in the visible church today? But let's have a look at some specific points of attraction. I'm going to give you six reasons why people are attracted into various forms of deception. And obviously, I've just come up with these, so there could be more. You could think of, of different ones, but I've just uh, come up with six. And the first reason, I think, and this is quite a common one, is people are looking for a cure for their pain. So, for example, um, you know, we're living in a fragile world, fragile bodies, things go wrong with our jobs, with our relationships, and nobody escapes pain in this world. And obviously, there's two kinds of pain, physical and emotional. So on the physical side, you'll find that people who are not interested in religion not interested in church, get a really bad medical diagnosis, they've got a few months to live, now they're going to start looking for answers. Now they're going to look for a cure for their pain because obviously they want to live. And so they've heard maybe about Bethel and there's miracles and healings there, and so they get sucked in that way. Um, and then, of course, and they get taught, you know, that God guarantees healing because it's in the atonement. And then, of course, there's emotional healing, so people who've experienced grief or some form of, some of, form of loss or trauma or just really in a state of depression, they're looking for relief and, and help. And so they are offered uh, all kinds of things. They are offered uh, deliverance sessions because perhaps, you know, you're depressed because your uncle was a Freemason or there's some sort of generation, generational curse over your bloodline. Uh, perhaps they offer you a sozo, which is a really despicable inner healing course. And uh, other sorts of uh, uh, solutions that they would offer, which basically really boil down to false promises and false hope. And that's what these false teachers offer, false promises and false hope, and they lure the people in. Then tied to this is people. some people are just looking for purpose for life, meaning for life. They're looking for a reason for pain and suffering in this world. So um, unfortunately... What they are told very often in the NAR, you know, the NAR has almost had a, 
uh, got a new method of evangelism. Instead of preaching the gospel, they come to people and say, you know, you're just such an amazing person. And I just want to call out the gold in you. And God's got a wonderful plan for your life. And you're going to, you're going to be propelled in your field. You're going to be one of the best well-known actors in Hollywood or God's going to elevate you into the business world and you're going to make millions so you can help us with this great uh, wealth transfer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are two reasons that uh, people are drawn in is a cure for pain or just a, a reason and answer for why there's pain and suffering in this world and what their purpose is. So let me just stop after those two, because these two reasons I want to make, I want to point out are not necessarily sinful. They're not inherently sinful. In fact, many of us came to Christ because God used these things as a means to draw us to the gospel. And obviously, it's the gospel alone that saves. But sometimes pain and suffering and, and pondering about our existence, why are we here? These are the things, the means that God uses to draw us to the gospel. Then, um, the third one. Now we're going more into people with ulterior motives who just really want to please their flesh. So on a superficial level, the attraction is simple as this. People are looking for a formula for success and fame. Uh, they want to be rich. So they taught if they just tithe, God will bless their finances. Basically, they're looking for a genie in a bottle. So that's on a really superficial level. And the health and wealth gospel tickles these ears. Then number four, some people, because I've heard all of these stories of angels and visions and going to heaven, they just want to have an ex a spiritual experience. They just want to have an encounter with God. Perhaps they've heard of, you know, heard the story of Brian Simmons or somebody died and went to hell and came back and saw heaven. Or perhaps they they uh, salivate when they hear the story of Heidi Baker who took a trip to heaven and God showed a room full of body parts that she could access to heal people. So they want to have the same experience and see an angel or experience something. And obviously the danger here is that these people led straight into various forms of mysticism. Then number five, um, obviously <clears throat> not a huge reason, but becoming bigger thanks to Bethel and the School of Supernatural Ministry. Um, they see the gospel or Christianity as a means to obtain spiritual powers. They they like Simon the Sorcerer. They like seven sons of Sceva. They want to see action. They want to think they can heal and raise the dead. And, and they are taught to do that by men like Daniel Kalender, who says that Jesus didn't perform miracles to show you what he could do. Jesus performed miracles to show you what you could do, which flies in the face of John 20, 30 to 31. Let me just read it. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In other words, they are written that you may believe Jesus is the Christ. Not they are written that you may believe and perform the same things or the same works that Jesus performed. It's a, um, it's a misinterpretation of John 14, 12, where Jesus says you will do greater works, which is referring not greater miracles, but the scope of the gospel, etc. cetera. Um, so that's number five, a means to obtain, obtain spiritual powers. Um, then on the highest level of wickedness, number six, this is about as wicked and as far as you can go. And these are these are the men, these are the men, the predators in the movement, in the in the visible church. These are the wolves and the and the predators. And I call them the purposefully wicked. That's what attracts the purposefully wicked. They see a golden opportunity to prey on the vulnerable, to exploit people, to abuse them sexually, to steal their money, to control them to have that, uh, be in that position where they can just live like kings and queens on this earth and, and control and manipulate people. And the Bible describes these people as wolves, as, as servants of Satan. They, Satan is their father. They, they like the false apostles of, of Corinth. They are the, the, the deceivers that we need to mark and avoid. Um, in summary, let me just point out that now these six reasons fit into each of the reasons will, will fit into one of three categories. The ones looking for in the ones in pain, looking for the reason for pain and suffering in this world, the ones following their passions, or the purposefully wicked. And uh, by put, placing them in one of these three categories, it will really help us, and we'll see right at the end 
uh, when we have a brief look at the book of Jude, how to approach and warn these people. Now, <clears throat> why do so few people escape the NAR? Why do so few people come out of the NAR or word of faith or prosperity gospel churches, these deceiving churches? Now, as we've seen, we could blame the cult-like environment. Um, but as we saw from the text in Timothy, that people are merely getting what they want. They're exactly where they want to be. They're being fed the lies that the itching ears want to hear. Um, then on the other hand, uh, some, some, some would sort of justify uh, these moves and these uh, churches and deceptive movements by saying that, well, how can so many people who are passionate for Jesus be wrong? We could reply that how can so many devoted, passionate Muslims be wrong, um, etc. So they 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 don't come out because they think they're in the right place, they're in the right crowd, and others, of course, will believe that they've had a genuine experience with God. So they don't want to come out because they think they've their goosebumps or the chills in their body was the Holy Spirit manifesting in them, or perhaps they received a a prophetic word and. and that was accurate. I mean, that's quite a huge thing today. And um, if you know how these these uh, false prophets prophets work, they they mine social media. They get information from the people in the audience who are going to be in the audience before the meeting, and that's how they can say, you know, well, is there someone living in uh, fifty six Pine Street, or does the number twenty three four eight mean anything to you, or do you have a a pink rabbit called Fluffy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They mine information, and that's how they, they seem to be accurate. And then a lot of people don't leave simply because they found a temporary cure for their pain. If they're lonely and depressed, now they found a group. They found a, a community that they can fellowship with, that, that look after them or care for them on a, on a purely physical or emotional level. They're not being spiritually fed, obviously, but, but that does mean something to them. And um, also... The, there's so much hype and expectation in the movement that, that they <clears throat> they might not be satisfied, but they believe the break they, they taught that it's coming. The best is yet to come. A breakthrough is just around the corner. God's going to do big and better things. So just hang on there. We know you're a little impatient, but it's coming. So they stick around. And sadly, um, you know, if you think about it now, this this movement's been going for maybe since the Toronto blessing and latter rain, but I mean, there's been a lot of deception in the world, in the visible church lately. And a whole generation of children are being brought up in this movement. So that's, you could say, you know, the question, why do so few escape? Because that's all they know. It's what they've been taught. It's what their parents taught them to do. It's like an animal being born in a zoo. It's happy in its cage. It's happy in its restricted environment. It thinks that's the best place to be. It doesn't know any better. And so unfortunately, perhaps you've seen videos of children as young as five, six in ecstatic trance-like uh, um, trance -like experience or prophesying or, or, or babbling off in, in gibberish and pretending it's imagining it's the, the, the gifting of tongues. So unfortunately, a whole generation of, of deceived kids are being raised in this movement. And um, here's probably a... a, a a bitter pill to swallow and uh, difficult for some of us uh, to to believe and accept. But I think the majority of people caught up in this movement are basically false converts. And so no matter how much you try and reason with them or, or you can come with the scriptures in context and it's there in black and white, but they've never been convicted of their sin. So they're not going to be convicted of these other errors. And by being convicted of their sin, I mean, they've never been saved. They're not born again. So they don't have this Holy Spirit dwelling in them who's going to illuminate the scriptures to them and show them the error. So these people don't need an argument or reasoning or you can send them 25 videos and articles on deception. What they need is to be born again. They're not indwelt by God. Um, Paul describes this kind of person in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. See, these people are spiritually blinded. Um, so what they need is the gospel. They need God to graciously open their eyes and save them. And um, now, some people who have um, had their eyes opened, let's say now you, 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 
you're in one of these churches, you're in the NR, and you, you've read some things, or praise God, maybe you've just through reading the Bible, you realized, wow, I've been deceived. And there's a point in which you have to leave. But some people linger on a little bit too long in these churches, which is really sad because the longer you stay, the more damage uh, you're going to have to deal with afterwards. But let's have a look at excuses for not leaving a church that you know teaches false doctrines. One of the first excuses people use, they reason and they say, well, you know, I'll simply ignore the bad teaching, I'll eat the meat, and I'll spit out the bones. And that's not a verse in the Bible, by the way. Um, but let me just read from Romans 16, 17. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Mark and avoid. Not mark and stay, stick around, etc. Mark and avoid. And it's very interesting. This voice points out, you know, the ones causing divisions in the visible church are the ones who are teaching false doctrines. Not the people who are, who are critiqued critiquing these self-appointed wolves and uh, prophets and apostles. You know, we often being accused as heresy hunters, as religious spirit, as being jealous. We're the ones causing division. No, we're not. It's the Daniel Calendars, the Bill Johnsons, the Patricia Kings, the Robert Moore. These are the people who are causing division in the church. Um, keep this in mind. By sitting under a pastor who twists the word of God, you are submitting yourself to someone God has disqualified. You are submitting yourself to someone responsible for damaging the faith of any believers in their ministry. That's a quote from an article I wrote a while back. And now let me remind you of God's warning to the church in Thyatira. He rebuked them for tolerating that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants. Um. You know, and people think, you know, it's not that bad, but uh, evil impost evil people and imposters are going to go from bad to worse. So your church might have started off with a with the Bethel song or, you know, reading a study guide through, through that's dubious or going through Jesus calling, whatever, Siri Young. The material is starting to creep in and you think it's going to, you can just, you know, be quiet because it'll pass. It's not going to pass. It's not going to pass. It, it's, it, deception is never static. It gets worse. So... There's no such thing as uh, ignore the bad teaching, eat the meat and spit out the bones. You have to leave. But point number two, people say, well, you know, I'm not going to leave because I'm going to stay and be a witness. I'm going to I'm going to change things. I'm going to turn things around you. Now, that might work for some time. But, um, you know, you can't stay in a church without, if there's a problem, you go to the elders, you go to the pastor, you go through the right channels, you ask questions, you submit evidence to show that this song is bad or full of uh, NAR theology or the book by this person, we shouldn't be going through our church. So you're obviously going to go through the right channels first. But, you know, that's going to end. Either you stay or you go. And generally speaking, most most churches, unfortunately, don't sort of change and, and realize they've, they've been teaching error. So it's not going to work out too well. Um, you know, things will probably get really ugly and nasty. So staying and being a witness, let me just tell you something. If you really want to be a witness and if you really want to be a testimony, the best thing you can do, if this church is really steeped in NAR and really full of heresy and false doctrine, the, the best thing to do, the thing that God commands you to do, in fact, is to leave. That is being a witness. That is being a testimony. Because what happens now, you are, you're out of that cult-like environment. They can do nothing to you. And people in the church left behind are going to hear that you've left. And now they're going to come to you and ask you questions. Why have you left? Now you have an opportunity to present the gospel. Now you have an opportunity to show them all the false teachings or the false practices going on in your church. That's how you be a testimony. You don't, you don't, uh, you're not going to be a testimony by staying in, in a polluted barrel or polluted stream. Then another reason, point number three, why um, people, excuses people, have is they think, you know, if I leave, I'm going to lose too much. And I'm sure you know that, you know, we can build up such a tight bond in church. I mean, sometimes our our best friends are in church. Sometimes all our friends and our family are in the church. So, you know, you stand to lose a lot if you leave. If you leave. You're going to lose a lot of friendships um, and perhaps even create a rift in your family. But uh, that's something Jesus warned about us, right? Uh, he said, you know, I didn't come to bring peace, uh, but a sword. So people reckon they'll lose too much. 
Um, then number four, pride. You know, pride prevents people from admitting they're wrong. If you now have been in a church 20 years, 30 years, and now you leave, you realize, you, you know, I've got nothing to show, and, and how can I tell people I'm wrong? It's, it's quite humiliating. Even worse is if you've, if you've been a pastor or a preacher and you've taught nonsense for 20 years, you've got to shut down your ministry, you've got to withdraw all your materials, you've got to shut down your uh, social media, everything. And of course, have you seen that happen with these guys? Nah, they just rebrand or move to another town and continue their nonsense, full of pride. Then this is quite an interesting one. Uh, and I've, I've heard this before, number five. People say that despite some bad doctrine, God is still moving. I still see God moving. But let's clarify what God moves. Because God moving is not people shaking during a fire tunnel. God moving is not people falling backwards. God moving is not glitter or feathers or gemstones in the auditorium. That's not God moving. Um, and basically what they're saying is they are, they are clinging to a subjective experience and placing that above the objective word of God. Now let me give you a description of what seems to be like God moving, but is in fact damnable deception. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There's a description of a whole bunch of, of uh, graduates from a school of supernatural ministry going about their signs and wonders and miracles. So, you know, it seems like God is moving, but actually they are really workers of lawlessness. They weren't doing anything according to the will of God. So, you know, to say, you know, God is moving, examine it, and you'll see it wasn't God moving at all, really. Or they say that, you know, well, there's a lot of good fruit. So, for example, a lot of ministries um, have a, a separate arm, like a um, I'm thinking of uh, Christine Kane, for example. She's a Word of Faith teacher, Mark and Avoid her. John Bevere, Prosperity Gospel, Word of Faith teacher, Mark and Avoid them. But both of those ministries do charitable works, uh, whether it's uh, tra human trafficking or, or getting gospel pamphlets out there or whatever. You know, that doesn't justify their false teachings. Then another one is uh, people think, if I leave, uh, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'll be without a spiritual covering. Um, you won't be because by sitting under false church and false teachers, you're not under a spiritual covering. You're under deception. Um, but they have been taught that if they leave, if they leave, you know, God might uh, bring some nasty things their way. And uh, so they instilled with fear from this cultic environment they've been in. And then, uh, not too common, but some people do play a valuable role in the church. Number seven, like you might be the main worship leader. You might... Uh, you might have a really important role in the ministry and you think that if you're leaving, you're going to let the church down. No. If it's a church teaching these blatant errors, you're letting God down if you don't leave. So that's their problem. But you have to get out of there as soon as you can. Obviously, you can put some measures in place or give a, like a, a warning one week or two weeks and try and make sure there's uh, some sort of backup plan. But that's not an excuse to stay. And... Um, then, of course, you know, you're at that point now, you know, I'm going to leave this false doctrine here. I should leave. But then you think, well, what's next for me? What's what then? There's nothing. I want to lose friends. I want to have a church. And people know that that there's a cost and they, they're a little bit tentative to 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 even try and imagine what it's going to be like. Because very often people leave these movements. They, don't, they haven't been taught how to read the Bible properly. They don't know how to pray properly. Um, they realized that that what they thought was God speaking in the head was just their vain imagination. So they're really scared of what um, what they're going to face. And that's why there are people and, and, and ministries that help and are there to support you. There's online groups um, and you're going to, you don't have to go through that journey alone and it, it'll be painful and you need to be re-educated and, and taught certain things. But I promise you there are hundreds if not thousands of people in that situation. You won't be alone, and so you need to reach out and get support. Now, to end off, um, let's have a look at, remember I was told you there's three groups of people. How do, we, how do we reach these people? So it's the people in pain or looking for a purpose, the people following their passions, and the purposefully wicked. 
And we see a principle in the book of Jude. Jude also makes a distinction between different classes of people and how to reach them. Let me read from Jude 1, verse, um, this is only one chapter, Jude verse 22 to 23. I'll read from the NASB. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. I really like uh, Matthew Henry's summary of, of these verses. Now, a lot of people see um, these verses as referring to two or three classes of people. But I think Matthew Henry sums it up. He says, there are two kinds of people who have been seduced, the weak and the willful. With the weak, our approach must be tender. And with the willful, we save with fear, urging the terrors of the Lord. Albert Barnes, another commentator, says, save with fear. It's undoubtedly true, while there is a class of persons who can be won to embrace religion by mild and gentle persuasion, there's another class who can be aroused only by the terrors of the law. So um, I think it's really helpful to see and discern which group we're looking for. So let, let me take um, the principle here in Jude, that there are different classes of the deceived who need a different approach. And let's apply that principle to the categories that, that I've listed. Those who are looking for a cure for pain or purpose in their life, those who are following their passions, and the purposely wicked. So, for example, category one, somebody who's looking uh, to cure their pain. So perhaps they needed physical healing and they started going to church where um, – really church with a church where they shouldn't go, Word of Faith Church or NAR Church like Bethel. And, uh, you know, they, they just want to live. They want healing. And the approach with these people must be with compassion. That's our approach towards these people, compassionate. So you won't go, let's say you're visiting that person. You don't storm at the house like a bull in the china shop and say, you've been deceived and you, 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 if you, um, you're going to hell and uh, whatever, whatever, and just come and just heap accusations and, and, and you know, there's, there's a way to speak the truth and it's in love. So with somebody in this situation, you're going to be very gentle and you're going to wait for an opportunity or ask God for an opportunity that you can explain to them that they might not be healed in this world. You could explain to them that healing in the Bible primarily when it comes to salvation means healing of our sins. You could point out that Paul couldn't heal Timothy or Trophimus or even himself. And you could explain that we all will be healed one day. Believers' physical bodies will be healed when we receive our glorified bodies. So there's a really a way to approach those people, and it's always with compassion. Then the ones who are just feeding their passions, the approach here is with a bit of compulsion. So example, somebody's uh, sucked into the health and wealth, I mean, the 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 prosperity gospel, um, you know, you're going to be firm there and just explain to them that uh, God doesn't guarantee wealth. And uh, if you've got an opportunity, explain to them what tithing really meant under the Old Testament and how we give under the New Testament and maybe point out that they're just seeking for the very same things that the world wants. The world wants health, wealth, uh, fame and fortune, success, and you can just point out to them that their desires are actually carnal and they're going to be disappointed because God's not going to fulfill their wicked desires. Um, point out, and if they if they say, well, things are going well, you just point out that the wicked also prosper. And um, yeah, so with, with that group, our attitude or our approach must be with compulsion. Then the purposefully wicked. And the approach towards these people is caution with caution because of fear of contamination. These are the wolves. These are the predators. These are the abusers. I don't think there's a right time or place to rebuke them. If you see them, you just rebuke these people. Um, if you've ever seen Justin Peters rebuke Todd Bentley to his face in a meeting, that's the approach we have towards these people. And then final, final point is pray for the people you're trying to reach. Pray for them. Uh, don't stop praying for them at any opportunity. Preach the gospel to them. And realize that only God can open their eyes. So you can approach people in the most loving, fashionable way, but uh, the truth is always going to be offensive to some degree. And uh, yeah, it's a sword that cuts. And then uh, wait for opportunities. As I've said, ask God for wisdom um, and let your approach be with compassion, with compulsion, or cautious. 
and all of them, in fact, you know, whenever there's false doctrine or false teachings, no matter how small or great, the gospel is always, a, it's a good idea to preach the gospel to people. Even as believers, we need to be reminded of the gospel daily because we can drift and swerve from the truth or get caught up in self-righteousness or guilt and condemnation. And the gospel is really the most marvelous, the most marvelous thing ever. Well, that concludes this episode. I hope and pray it's been helpful. Um, God willing, I might put up some more content in the future. Um, but that's it for now. So thanks for watching and bye.